Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Ethical Consumer Podcast. I'm your host, Julia, and today with me, I have Jennifer Terry, who is currently serving as the External Affairs Manager at Des Moines Waterworks. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you. And you're you're actually the mother of one of my dear friends, too. So this is like a familiar <laughs> situation. You guys know I like to have my friends on. <laughs> I love her, happy. too. She's pretty great. So you are currently serving as, and I have to read this because you've always had very long titles, external affairs manager at Des Moines Waterworks. But that is, this is your second stint at Des Moines Waterworks. And you've kind of hopped back and forth between the Waterworks site and also the Envi Iowa Environmental Council. That's right. So you've had an interesting hop back and forth, which I think lends you a very unique perspective as far as what goes on with city water, municipal water, and how this is affected by where that water is being taken from and how we affect that positively through legislation and government action at times and just cooperation with everybody, the consumers, the farmers that have the land that is perhaps feeding into these waterways and how the city treats it. So I'm super stoked. We just had Rising Springs, uh, Nicoya Hecht on, and we talked about some natural spring water, and now we have some city water, a different perspective. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm excited. Now, before you were bouncing back and forth between Des Moines Waterworks and the Envi uh, Iowa Environmental Council. I can't say that right. And Iowa Environmental Council. I'm trying to say environment first. That's okay. <laughs> Um, you were, you were, you were a humble human <laughs> and you were having your own life. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing and how you became passionate about water, your, your job, your schooling, and how you ended up the magnificent person you are. Oh, thank you. Um, well, I was, uh, I'm an Iowa native, so I was raised on a dairy farm actually, which is a surprise to some people who are just getting to know me, but it was the best life ever. I was the youngest of four kids. I always say I was a feral child <laughs> because on, on a busy dairy farm and you're the littlest one, you have very little supervision. <laughs> so um, it was a great way to grow up, but my, my parents were very progressive about land and water issues. And so they were always on the cutting edge of trying new things like no-till and, and, and things like that on our farm. And we, we were one of those old families fashion 60s sort of closed loop you know ecosystem where we raised cattle and they produced milk and we produced hay and, and and you know and we had cattle that we butchered and so we were just one of those old-fashioned really regenerative type of farms and so they were very passionate and they passed that along to their kids and so I've always had a passion for water and so this is just the most wonderful job for me because I get to bring it all together Oh, cool. I've, I've been calling you the Aaron Brockovich of Iowa because I just think what you do <laughs> is like phenomenal and amazing. And <laughs> I love she's it. Very, she's, she's very brave. She's incredible. <laughs> yes. Maybe you, you are perhaps one would say a little bit more palatable than Aaron Brockovich. So you, you, you deliver the message in a little bit more of a, um, I don't know, not kinder. I think she's still a very kind woman, but uh, perhaps... Maybe Diplomatic. Diplomatic. There we go. I like that. I mean, that. if you're going to um, do government relations, you have to have a, sort of a diplomatic angle. Yes. <laughs> yes. I think both are necessary. And again, going back to the, the previous episode with Rising Springs, too, there are so many facets that you have to look at. And you have advocates and you have conservationists and you have people in the government who can associate with one of those two things, but are also affecting change in government and maybe aren't like standing out there with a sign or something like that too. So yeah, that's a great point. It takes, it takes on the policy spectrum. It takes all kinds. There's all sorts of spaces in there mm -hmm, for sure. That are helpful. Yes. So you, let's see, you went to, uh, you, you had a career change if I remember correctly. Is that right? I did. I uh, took a 30 year hiatus from college. I love it. I love it. <laughs> and then when my two wonderful daughters went to college, um, I moved to Iowa City and I started law school when I was 49. Okay. And so um, I've always wanted to go to law school. And, and even when I was in fifth grade, my mom kept a little uh, form that I had filled out asking what I wanted to be when I grew up. So when I was nine, I said I wanted to be an attorney. <gasps> I don't think I even knew it. And you did it. <laughs> and I just thought that you could make change, positive change if you were an attorney. I had that in my head. So 
Um, I graduated from law school when I was 52. And um, I was actually uh, did prosecuting work when I was in law school. Mm -hmm. And then I defended also um, on the other side in, in the legal clinic. So I got to see sort of a you know, 360 of how people make decisions and, and, and how they're treated by the legal system and, and, and so on. So that was really mind expanding and great. And then I decided I want to work on land and water issues. And so um, I had the um, gift of starting at the Iowa Environmental Council as a uh, policy advocate, agricultural policy specialist. So um, Law school was difficult, but it was. Um, I'm really glad that I did it. it. It it really sharpens your analytical skills and your writing skills. And it's um, even if you aren't a practicing attorney, which I am a licensed attorney, but I don't practice in a firm the way most people think. Mm -hmm. um, it's been really valuable to me. So that was one of my biggest life goals was to. I switched careers and moved and graduated from law school, and my kids left for college, and it was a lot of change. <laughs> in a short period of time change is good. good change can be a good thing I love that you you never gave up that dream you know maybe life took you elsewhere but that that your mother still has that would you say it was your fifth grade fifth grade project <laughs> you're like I'm gonna be an attorney for I don't think I'm not sure I knew the difference between an attorney and anyone else that would perhaps appear in a courtroom or legislation session <laughs> when I was in fifth grade <laughs> I know, isn't it funny? I'm not sure, but I was always really, I had a passion for animals and, and the land. And so like when I was a kid, I remember writing letters about baby harp seals and like, like, like saving them. Oh, <laughs> like when, when we were kids, you know, it's just funny. So I think I was just raised in a family where um, we had a certain set of values and you were expected to act on those sure. <laughs> for the greater good. And so uh, that's how it came out was, I guess, me with animals and Land. Mm, I love that. And I would assume, I don't know, I don't know the timeline of land treatment or land stewardship or what has happened as far as the farming and agricultural industry goes. But I'm going to assume that no-till farming, of course, used to be you're going to till that up and, you know, degrade it as much as possible. Unfortunately, people didn't know that they were doing that at the time back in the day. But then there was, you know, pesticide usage and fertilizer usage. I'm going to guess that when your parents were implementing this no-till, that this might have been a little bit before its time. I think you, you're seeing a lot of farms now, perhaps uh, a friend of mine, Yellow Table Farm, Eric, was on. Uh, he lives in Tripola, Iowa. He's doing no-till farming. And when he bought this farm, that was his goal. He never switched. He's like, I'm doing no-till farming as much as I can. I'm going to make this work. And I think you're seeing that more and more. But... I'm wondering when when was that switch? And maybe you don't know since you have been out of the farming community for a while now. But I mean, you said that that was pretty pretty cutting edge of your parents to be doing at that time. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it was in the global sense, but I'm, I think um, my family has um, has always thought outside the box in various ways. And so um, I think even at that time, or even now, especially in the farming community, if you want to be a regenerative farmer and you want to do things differently, you have to be very brave to do that. And you have to not care what other people think about you. And um, that's an important trait to have when you're working on land and water issues. You know, um, I don't seek approval from, from people who don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> so Good life lesson. Um, that, that's kind of the attitude that you need, which is um, if you think this is right and this is your value system, then you should do it. And so I, I'm certain that people would drive by and say, what are those crazy Terry's doing now? Um, and still people, unfortunately, um, run into that. I talk to farmers all the time who say, uh, yeah, nobody really wants to have coffee with me up at the co-op or whatever because of the way that, that I farm. And Aww. isn't that something? Um, but, you know, I belong to an organization called Practical Farmers of Iowa, oh. and they do amazing work. And so they embolden people to think differently and do different um, things on their farms. And um, so, you know, organizations like that, I can't say enough good things about. They are changing the way we're thinking, again, about farming, which is great. Sure. Um, so, and, and as far as when did practices change, again, I'm not an expert, but I would say, you know, there came a time when in the 70s and 80s in the farm crisis and all, and people quit having cattle on the land, which meant less less small grains and alfalfa, and that meant more corn and soybeans. And so um, 
the reason that we have water quality issues in our source water and rivers and streams is because of land use. It's from intensive row cropping of corn and soybeans and what that means um, to the water and land. And um, I'm so happy that people and like your friend are understanding that, you know, it can it, it doesn't have to be that way. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's super encouraging. I think so, too. It, it was really, really interesting to hear his take on it. And I think we're going to see a few more local farmers that are doing innovative regenerative farming like that, too, just because I I wasn't aware of it until I was made aware. Obviously, you can't know something until you know it. And now that I know about it, I'm curious to see how other farms are handling this. You know, I think everyone has their situation that works for them, whether it's a dairy farm or whether it's a produce farm with some chickens, with some sheep. Every, everyone just kind of has to find their own thing. And yeah, that makes me really sad that you were talking to these farmers and they, they don't feel like they have a place at the table because they're doing something something different. And I don't know, maybe maybe the folks on the other side see what they're doing and Maybe they just don't know how to accomplish it either. So they almost feel like a little bit guilty or like so, or like the regenerative farmers are going to be like, oh, they're not, they're not saving the land. They're ruining it. But it, it's hard to implement. It is a challenge. And I, I think like anything else, you can't just flip a switch and change to a new and different way of doing things, especially when, you know, the amount of output you can get from your farm also defines your lifestyle and how you live how you can take care of your family it's it's not an easy switch and it's not black and white either yeah no that's absolutely true and i i mean it's imperative to point out that um there's this giant you know elephant in the room called the farm bill Mm -hmm. and so the farm bill is not a regenerative policy the farm bill is production policy Mm -hmm. so farmers get rewarded for producing corn and soybean and other commodity you know commodities so i mean things need to change at the at the federal level mm-hmm. too um but it's just so it's so cool to talk to people like these pfi people who um who are doing these things and trying these things and taking these risks but they have this beautiful um lifestyle um there's a new they just did a screening last night practical farmers Viowa called livestock on the land and mm-hmm. it had these amazing interviews with people who and they're raising their kids in these you know just these ecosystems on their farms and they have cattle and I love cattle. Like people don't know I love cattle. I absolutely love cattle. And so that was fun. Um, but yeah, I think that, I think that you're right. It's, it's hard to, to try to do something new that, that you don't have never done before. Mm-hmm. And we're all like that. Oh, so yeah. I talk to farmers all the time, like, Oh, we can't do no till. I mean, this is the way my dad did it. And his dad did it. And this is the way we do it. And so we plow. Well, actually, there's really no reason to do fall plowing. We just need to get more science, very science-based um, approach. Is And then getting farmers to talk to farmers is, I understand, a good way to, to spread these practices. Mm-hmm. But From what Eric said, there is just a beautiful community of farms in this Cedar Falls, Waterloo area. He's in Drapola, which I think, if I remember correctly, is about 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes away. Um and they all help. It's been beautiful. It's there's such a community to it, and I hope everyone finds their community because they at one point were over helping friends of mine at Tomorrow's Acres putting up their um, what is it called a high tunnel so that they can have more oh. things in the off season too. Because Iowa's weather is well, there's a bunch of snow outside and it's absolutely freezing today. My paws hurt. I need my gloves. Um, <laughs> it, it, they're all working together. They all help. And I think they all take little bits and pieces of what someone else has started doing or a different type of you know natural fertilizer that someone else has used or a different technique. I think it's a really beautiful thing. This this Practical Farmers of Iowa, I'm going to look into that. That sounds amazing. And yeah, the livestock... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to. Oh, no, that's okay. Oh, that's the okay. livestock the on livestock. the land, are they able, is are, is that viewable for everybody? I don't know. They just introduced it last night, okay. so I had a glass of wine and watched yes. it. Yes, no. <laughs> I'll have to check that. I love you for that. You're having your wine and you're watching livestock on the land. That is an <laughs> ideal Thursday night for me. <laughs> I love it. Um, when you're talking about the, the, the fellowship, though, it's, 
it's funny because we are adopting a brand which was introduced, but we're going to be talking more about it this year at Dwayne Waterworks, which is Think Downstream. Mm -hmm. And so we've been talking a lot about what does that mean? And so that means how you speak to others. It means how you use your resources. It means your philosophy. And so I think when you're talking about those farms, look, farmers lifting each other up think of them thinking downstream they're not only literally thinking downstream mm -hmm. of water quality and offsite impacts to the what they do on their land but they're thinking downstream of more generations um so that's that's a really interesting way to think about that i like that i've uh, heard the thinking downstream and I, I know you've referenced this before and this is the the entire is it the slogan for des moines waterworks or kind of a so campaign it's been a it's been a kind of a tagline but we have a um a we're going to be introducing it as more of a brand this year, okay. which is, again, the way that we approach our social media platforms mm -hmm. and things is thinking downstream and a, a real holistic approach to um, how we how we think about things and uh, what we do and what we say. Sure. I like that application for the future generations, too, not just the water, thinking about what goes on higher up in a river, north to south, or wherever it flows. Yeah, it's but beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So it's also, when you say think downstream, it's, it's educational because this is so funny. So if you you know what a watershed is, which um, so people don't understand what watersheds are. And so if you don't understand what a watershed is, you can't understand why it matters what you're doing 200 miles away from us. Sure. So part of our job is to educate people about what think downstream even means. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the Gulf um, hypoxic zone is directly correlated to what we do here in mm -hmm. Iowa. We're one of the largest contributors of nitrogen to this Mississippi River. That's not okay. Right. And we need to own that, and we need to be very clear that it's not okay and what we're going to do to fix that. So, um, but if you, you, we all, and so I like when people come on tours, I always um, start out and I go, how many of you live in a watershed? Raise your hand. And it's like, they're kind of like, I don't really know. And I'm like, it's a trick question. You all do. <laughs> <laughs> And so once you understand that what you do affects everybody downstream, that change, that just makes a lot of light bulbs. Yes, go off. definitely. Now, the watershed, what you're talking about, could you define that for those who are not sure of what that is? Since some of our listeners may be in that category of, I don't, I don't know, do I live in a watershed? Well, now you know you do. So <laughs> you, do, probably, you, you actually live in several because they're all nestled, like nested within. Mm -hmm. But a watershed is a, a, a geographic space where when a drop of water falls on it, it all flows to the same place. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess, a really simplistic way to put sure. it. So in the larger sense, all of us here are in the Mississippi um, uh, river watershed mm -hmm. uh, basin, the Mississippi River Basin, and then you have smaller and smaller little watersheds that that, that you live in at home. Like, you know, if, if we live in um, the Iowa watershed or the Cedar River watershed, mm -hmm. I think is probably where you live. Yes. Um, so Des Moines Waterworks relies on two watersheds to get our source water primarily. One is the Des Moines River watershed and one is the Raccoon River watershed. Mm -hmm. And so what happens yeah, 50, 100, 200 miles um, to our north uh, makes a huge difference in how we have to treat our water sure. and, and, you know, how we do our work uh, because we all live in the same watershed. So, yes, everybody lives in a watershed. Everybody, everybody. <laughs> We're all connected, guys. Did you know? If you didn't already, let's just establish that right now. <laughs> Very That's much right. connected. And all of that, yes, all of what we're doing up here is going downstream to the Gulf of Mexico. Like you said, you don't you don't really think about Iowa being directly connected to the Gulf of Mexico, but here we are. It's for real. And it's, it's so funny because I was on a, a work trip down there a couple of years ago, and I got to ride in a boat with a shrimper. Ooh. And he told us like how his life had been impacted by our choices mm. and our choices of not controlling the pollution that we send down to him. Wow. I mean, he wasn't angry or anything. Right. He was just like facts out. And that really got to me because I come from, you know, generations of farming and it really speaks to you. And I wish everyone could speak to someone. Oh, sure. In that way, because it, it, it was not an accusatory or anything like that. It's just like what you guys are doing up there are making it uh, impossible for me to make a living. That's pretty powerful. Oh, my heart. Yeah. Holy buckets. <laughs> this, yeah. That, that's something you don't, you don't think about everything being as closely connected like that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Ooh. Anyways, before I get emotional. Whew. So, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, that's all right. Let's move on to something happier. That's a, yeah. Well, that's, I mean, that's just <laughs> such an impactful statement to have that direct correlation or that direct comparison to what's 
what's actually going on. We don't think enough downstream. You know, maybe think we think of the next tier or the second tier after, but, you know, eight or nine tiers later in a couple states farther south, that's still. And, and the... It, it compiles if you think about coming from, you know, Itasca all the way up all, all uh, at the very start. Absolutely. I, I've walked in the, that water up there with my family when we'd go up to Minnesota. It's like, here, here's the start. Here's that tiny little <laughs> trickle. <laughs> Here it is shin deep. This is the same water that's going down when you go over to the Quad Cities. And, uh, yeah, it's really, it's it makes you feel pretty small and also... It's small but significant because you realize my feet have actually been in that water. <laughs> Isn't that funny? I know. It's really wild. I, um, when people say that they've walked across the Mississippi River, it's always kind of funny. Yeah. Fun. Yes. <laughs> yep. Done that. Did that when I was 12. I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> I still think it's pretty cool. But, well, let's talk about some of the good that's going on. Yeah. And let's start kind of back at the beginning, your your first project with the in Iowa Environmental Council. Oh, okay, cool. So my job was to, um, was agriculture a policy specialist. Okay. And so I had a wonderful gift. And actually, it's been this way my, my whole career has, I've, been fortunate enough to have these wonderful mentors. And um, I had a wonderful mentor at the Iowa Environmental Council named Susan Heathcote. She was the water program director for 23, 25 years. Mm -hmm. And so she was very patient. She was a geologist and I don't, I'm not a scientist. I'm uh, an attorney by training and I, I, I like to write. I don't like to really, I haven't not had a passion for science and math. I'm trying to be really diplomatic in <laughs> my passion is, uh, is writing. So she was really patient with me. She was, a, I think, a geology um, major. So she taught me all about how water works and, 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 and what it means and the boundaries and, and how protective people are and watersheds. Water is very personal to people. So she was very patient in not only helping me understand that, but also the political landscape and how you make change. And so um, I, my job was to try and uh, strengthen laws and policies in the state that would better protect our water. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you're trying to clean up the water, restore it, and, and, uh, and protect it here in Iowa, you very quickly move into the conversation about agricultural production. Sure. And that's not because... Uh, you're unfairly trying to target them is because it's just the way it is. We have very, very little public lands in this in the state. Mm -hmm. um, so when we have private lands that are primarily in producing uh, commodity row crops, that means certain things. That means that the water runs very quickly off the land. That means we have agricultural tile drainage that, that increases and mainlines those those nutrient pollut pollutants down to us. So my job was to try and cross the line, cross the aisle and meet with ag groups and meet with all kinds of people. It was just a wonderful study in coalition building. Mm. And I found out that I love to build things. And I love to um, try, you know, I, I like to reach out to people. And so all they can say is no. Sure. <laughs> so it's really important to, to put yourself out there and, and say, would you like to have coffee with me? And we know we don't really um, agree on everything. And sometimes I say things in the Des Moines Register that upset you. But could we just talk about it? Because we might find something in the middle of the Venn diagram that we can work on together. And that is a magical sweet spot to try and locate. Sure. The fact that you don't have so, to completely align in your beliefs. I think that, you know, not to get super political in this episode or anything, I like to walk that middle ground. But... Mm -hmm. Uh, we can find middle ground, guys. We really can. Everything has become very polarized. And I think it's 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 nice that that was your original project because you understand the importance of, can we just find one thing and tackle that together <laughs> instead of, we don't have to line up all the way, guys. Come on. We, we don't have to see eye to eye on every single pillar of beliefs. But we, we got one or two. And if, if you, and, and you know, I did, I learned a lot about coalition building. Mm -hmm. I learned that, um, in fact, I had someone tell me that compromise is defeat. Ooh. And I completely disagree. Yeah. And so when you are entrenched and your ego is attached to your opinions, you find it hard to, uh, to find that common ground. So, you know, you ha people have to come to the table um, bargaining in good faith, so to speak. So if you come to the table and the only thing you want to do is stop progress, that's not bargaining in good faith. Mm -mm. 
I don't, life's too short to talk to people that aren't listening. Sure. And so you have only so much time and resources. Um, and so you need to spend on people who are actually wanting to make things better and not just at the table to stop things mm -hmm. or derail things or throw grenades. Sure. And so I learned that you can usually find the middle ground and, and that sweet spot, but sometimes it's not possible and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. And then you know which battles to pick and then you, yes. Right. <laughs> I always like cooperating with people. It makes me very happy. The, the <laughs> coalition, as you said, I think it, it's, it's just one of the most important things that we can do is work together because everything has been so separate as far as, well, I mean, until, until recently, I think everything's starting to come together. Everyone has to be on board and do these tiny little changes. Not everyone has to believe in every single change that's being done, but we can all work toward just making life a little better. That's that's a really that's pretty profound. I know because it seems like overwhelming. Like if you're trying to lift the whole world, but maybe you can just like lift this little piece of it. Yes, <laughs> I'm gonna lift this so that you guys have a little less weight over there. How about that? Can we do that? We can do that. <laughs> but I guess I don't want to sugarcoat it either. So working on water quality in Iowa um, is not for the faint of heart. Sure. Um, I was at a conference in, I think, Texas, and I was sitting with a rancher at dinner, and, and he asked what I did for a living, and I said, I'm in I, I work on environmental policy in Iowa, and he just laughed, you know, and he's like, he's like pretty emotional, right? And I'm like, yeah, and he said something like, an old saying is, um, whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. Oh. And of course, he was thinking about water quantity right sure. because they don't have very much water but here it's water quality and so people take water discussions very seriously mm -hmm. and personally and so um you have to navigate all that and you have to have very thick skin and um a few years ago when i was here at waterworks before uh, the des moines waterworks board of trustees chose to file a lawsuit which was um against some counties to our north and so that has caused animosity with some of those folks and um, you know, they say things like they don't trust us. Well, we have an obligation to support the public health and safety of our customers. Mm -hmm. And we serve 500,000 customers. One sixth of Iowa's population are our customers um, in the metro. And so um, we tried for decades to work with people up in the watershed very closely for 20, 30 years to solve these problems. Mm -hmm. And we weren't seeing an improvement. And so we were basically left with little choice. And so trust is a two-way street. So when people start telling me that that I'm pointing fingers or you're pointing fingers, we all just need to take a deep breath and, and understand that trust runs both ways. Mm -hmm. And so if somebody's not trusting you and you're not, and perhaps you have been part of that. Sure. And so that's been a learning process here as well. And, and you know, people, um, my former boss, the CEO here was named Bill Stowe, and he took a ton of abuse because of the lawsuit mm -hmm. and it was very personal and, and there were threats and um, you know honestly he and I didn't feel safe going in certain places in the state to do presentations at that time. Holy cow. And so that's how serious things get when you start talking about water quality. Sure. Um, so I learned firsthand through that process that it is very personal and people become very angry and uh, um, and so you, you just have to be pretty brave to work on water quality issues here. You have to be able to say difficult things if you really want to make progress. Sure. And the Iowa Environmental Council was great. Like, that was a great, you know, breeding ground for that as well because I think it's fun, but you you have to bring truth to conversations, and I enjoy doing that. Mm -hmm. I, um, so that's fun, but it, it can be daunting to be the person who has to bring up the uncomfortable scientific truth in the room. Sure. <laughs> um, but it's so important. I think when I hope I didn't make you uncomfortable by you know your uh, associating you with the Aaron Brockovich of Iowa, but it's <laughs> it's not even you know someone consider brash. I, I consider very brave and very bold what she does. But it like you said, you know you didn't feel you didn't always feel safe going into places to talk about certain things. That's concerning, and the fact that something would get so heated when you're really just looking out for the health of the consumers, or the public in this case, it, it, it takes a lot of bravery to go and speak truth, which can be very challenging when you're, you have a truth 
as working for Des Moines Water Works or Envi Iowa Envi Environmental Council. I still can't say that. Environment wants struggle. to come <laughs> first. <laughs> IEC. It's the That's IEC okay. from here on out. Um, when you're when you're representing them, you are speaking their truth and people in counties north of the watershed that are feeding into that area they are speaking their truth and both truths can coexist but you also have to find like you said that venn diagram in the middle okay here's what i'm concerned about here's what you're concerned about i see you i hear you now how can we come to a resolution that's going to benefit both of us yeah and, and civility mm -hmm. yes and I'll be friends, or at least, you know, n not enemies at the end. <laughs> you know what, what would be really helpful, though, in this space, and I say it all the time, is um, there an increase in diversity and inclusion in this space mm -hmm. would be so helpful. And so another thing that I've learned at Waterworks and IEC is to sit down for a meeting, a policy meeting, and just look at who's around the table. And that can be used in any field. So who's not here? Mm -hmm. And so if you look at water quality and land and water issues in Iowa, it's generally this has been the same old players. And so we sit down and we go, well, who's representing public health here? Sure. Because there's a voice that doesn't very often get to sit at the table with large agricultural industries. Mm -hmm. And they bring a whole perspective that the rest of us don't. And so um, who's, who's, who's the voice of um, low income neighborhoods? Like, are they at the table? Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a, a robust um, Im immigrant population here in Des Moines, and we often see them pushing um, carts of bottled water through the grocery stores because where they came from, the water is not safe to drink, but it is here. Sure. And so one of the things we want to do this year is an educational campaign about how, you know, bottled water is much more costly and so on. So our water is safe. How can we help you, you know, g get more of it? And, and so reaching out to those kind of communities. So we need more inclusion and more diversity in the water quality discussions mm -hmm. instead of status quo, same old people who've always been making these decisions and ensuring that things stay the same, stay the same. Sure. And everyone, everyone involved in the discussion right now, it sounds like, is affected by it. But yes, underserved populations are not, and not even just with water quality and voice in that aspect. But in the past year, I think everyone hopefully has started to realize that there are a lot of people that are not being paid attention to and that are, are not considered and they've never been given a voice to share how they feel about it. And yes. that contact has not been there either. Like you said, coming from other countries, um, I, I don't drink the tap water when we're in Europe and I don't like buying bottled water, but that is just their setup over there. You, you don't, you don't drink the water from the tap in most places, you know, some, some do have filtration systems, but over there, their bottled water quality also, by the way, oh, immaculate. It's wonderful because <laughs> that, that's what they pay more attention yeah, to right. because right. That's, that's their situation. Here, though, yes, a lot of public water can be filtered and purified enough to be better than certain brands of bottled water, which is something that a lot of people don't realize either. Yeah, and, and we're actually more heavily regulated mm -hmm. uh, as public water supplies. So there, that's like the subject of a whole other podcast. Yeah, but. <laughs> well, maybe we'll have you on a second time. <laughs> I love the way that you said, like, raising up other voices, mm -hmm. though. And, and again, in the water space, um, I saw this great um, post yesterday that said, um, empowered women empower women. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, a voice that has been missing in this water space is women mm -hmm. talking telling their stories about water and they are so powerful and if you can get them to tell their stories and share their stories then you start building this wonderful framework you know sort of like the farmers we were talking about sure. if you if you build a community of people who have trust and are willing to speak out you're going to get a really different story mm -hmm. and you started and so, oh sorry go ahead no 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 just raising up the, the voices of women of all ages mm -hmm. uh, is so important in this space I love that. You you actually started a project called Women Iowa Women for Water a few years ago too. I'm assuming based on this inspiration of we need to share the stories. Yes. Well, actually, it was much more gritty than that. Mm, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, another um, 
colleague of mine and I were, it was, I don't even know what year it was, maybe 2016. We were sitting at the state capitol and there, everybody was, there was a lot of controversy about water quality and legislation. And she and I were just sitting there just like, all we're hearing right now is lots of, um, lots of men just harumphing and yelling stuff about water. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it started. And not to be offensive, but that is exactly how it started. Sure. Um, and so we're like, you know, we can do better than this. How can we raise up the voices of women? And so um, we added a third person. So the three of us started this, um, this little effort initiative called Iowa Women for Water. And we started having these meetings and they were so cool where we would have small group meetings called little collectives almost. And so um, we would ask people to share their first memory of water. Oh, wow. And it was just like, I have goosebumps. It was so wonderful to hear these stories. Mm. And um, like mine was, I remember like when I was really, really little, I'm like, goodbye, I'm going to go swim in the, in the creek. Sure, do that by yourself when you're seven. I just would get okay. on my bike and ride down the gravel road and swim with the cattle, you know. Um, but these women were just telling these stories. And, and one of them was this retired nurse. And, and she said, well, I guess your first experience with water was before you're born, right? Ooh. <laughs> and your mother's woman were like, yes, that would be your yeah. first experience with water. Maybe you don't remember um, that, but Yeah. So we just got these really great stories and, and um, we started doing, and, and there was a lot of different viewpoints in Women for Water that we were wanting to get um, from different uh, geo, you know, geographical parts of the state and socioeconomic parts of the state and, and ages and all these walks of life and things to get all. So we, we were trying to be really inclusive and not be like uh, very politically uh, polarizing. Sure. And so we were able to come up with some ways of advocating to their legislators and, and to their elected officials and empowering them. And gosh, I learned so much about how, you know, still to this day, a lot of women in rural Iowa just, um, I, I just don't think their voices get to be heard. And so um, that was a really gratifying piece is when we could lift up their stories and, and, and tell them it's okay to say it. Like maybe your husband uh, won't no one will speak to him at the farmers co-op the next day <laughs> right <laughs> <Okay>. sorry <laughs> hubby i gotta share my story too <laughs> so that was cool i'm trying to think of what my first experience yes, I, know. I don't know well i shared that lake itasca story i guess uh, probably my first the the one that is coming to mind is going up to a cabin in Minnesota every summer with my family. I, I, <laughs> oh man. I, so there was one year that I, I was so excited because I love swimming in the water and I was so excited that I just could not wait. And I was not supposed to go on the dock without my life jacket. So I was, I was right. of an age where you needed the life jacket on the dock still. Right. And I was just not having that because they were unpacking the car. And after this year, by the way, my parents changed the order in which they packed the car so that the life jackets would be on top. So they didn't, so this didn't happen again. So thanks, thanks parents for that. Strategic. Oh, it was very strategic. Well, I happened to have fallen in the lake. I, <laughs> they were okay. unpacking the car. I was fine, thankfully. Oh it was mildly traumatizing, but, um, uh, yeah, yeah. I went out on the dock. I wanted to go, and we would go up with another family. And Brian, their son, is a year older than me, and uh, I, I don't quite remember being in the water. You know, you get those little glimpses of memories, and they're just they're just emblazoned <laughs> into your your brain. I do see, I see the corner of the dock when I'm in the water. I'm freaking out because I hate seaweed. And oh. Brian pulls me out. And I have to walk up to the cabin door, sopping wet. I was wearing a pink dress, a pink cloth oh. dress, and tell my parents that I fell in the lake. And mom said, what happened? I'm like, were you supposed to do that without your life jacket? No. <laughs> so yeah, years after my parents learned to put the life jackets on top of the rest of the things, <laughs> needless to so say. Great. But there's there's yeah, I mean, that my is story. one of your first memories. That's so cool. I was young. Water's really different up there, isn't it? It is. Yes, very much so. And this was in um 
we were around the Brainerd area. I cannot think yeah. of what the chain of lakes is called anymore. Pine Terrace is the resort that we'd go to. So oh, cool. there's some memories there. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good stuff. Oh, Isn't it, but, you know, you bring up another point, which is, you know, should you really have to drive nine hours to swim in clean water? Right. I there's I mean I have Just friends that. that do triathlons in the area and they go out and swim in some of the bodies of water here and I'm thinking there is no way I'm putting my face or any orifice of my body in that body that's no the nose the ears the eyeballs because, there aren't you know, going you in check there. the beach advisories and, and the public beach advisories for you know toxic algal blooms and and just like E. coli levels and yeah. things and you know we need to have a state in which we value clean water so that all of us get to recreate not just people who have the luxury of driving to northern wisconsin yes so um it's really an equity issue that just because you can't afford a water park pass what's your water park up there lost island yes lost island yep yeah we're about two hours away from each other for our listeners i'm up in cedar falls and jennifer's in des moines so about two hours away so if you can't afford those water park passes, you should be able to swim in your public beaches and feel safe and, yeah. and enjoy that. that that's, was, I mean, that seems common sense, right? Oh, I would think so too. That was a big stir um, in the beginning of last summer was, you know, everyone's trying to do what they can to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And it was, I mean, it was a mess when the water park said we will not be taking day passes we will only be having season pass holders oh my. and that i don't remember i don't remember what the cost was i remember thinking you know well first of all how many times are these people going to the pool that this is this is now a cost effective option to spend this much money on a pool pass but when you when you have a family of multiple kids i'm 100 percent sure it is but that's a big investment to not know and they're just doing everything they can but to not know if the pool was going to close if one lifeguard tested positive are they going to be able to use their whole pass but the biggest thing was so many people couldn't afford that so then they were no longer they couldn't go to the pool their kids couldn't go swimming because right. our water is a little questionable and uh, you know safety big open water making sure everyone stays close by having lifeguards is a benefit but that prevented a lot of people from being able to enjoy the water this past summer perfect that's an excellent example and wouldn't it be great if they could just get in their car and drive to a lake a nearby lake oh, yeah. and it was beautiful and blue and you know and that's the thing minnesota has really great um laws mm -hmm. that protect their water um because I don't know which came first, but it's sort of like they have these wonderful resources, and so now they protect them. Sure. And so, um, I want to I want to grow a state where we care as much. I want to all of us have a shared passion for clean water. And so, if that's important to you, then you should vote your values. Sure. You know, our, our state legislature has a really big can play a really big part in protecting our water resources, and so. Um, I want to have a vision for clean water here. Mm -hmm. And it and it doesn't mean that we don't have agriculture here. That's not true. Right. Yeah, absolutely. This is that's what we do here. And so but we can do we can live uh, we can, you know, live in harmony if we're all willing to have honest conversations. Mm -hmm. Is that so it. is what you're doing right now with your current position as the external affairs manager? External affairs, I'm assuming dealing with public and what's going on outside of Des Moines Water Waterworks and how that affects what you do and then working with the IEC and uh, everyone else at the Capitol. Well, maybe you should just describe what you do because I'm assuming that's exactly what you're doing right <laughs> well, now. No, I, think, I think you did a great job. You can move on if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, ex everything external. So I have a, a wonderful, I mean, it's like a dream job. It's so mm -hmm. great. My office is overlooking Des Moines Waterworks Park, which is one of the largest urban parks in the nation. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. Everyone should come here um, to recreate. I have it's kayaked really on it, and I have, have yes, I have walked around it. I have run around it, and I have kayaked on it. My sweet Matthew decided it would be, we were just talking to a couple friends about this the other day. He decided he would surprise me by taking me tandem kayaking and didn't tell me what we were doing. So I didn't have a swimsuit, so I had a soggy butt. <laughs> I wore the wrong shoes. 
And I love my honey so much. We are both musicians. You think our rhythm with tandem kayaking would just be excellent? Um, we're going to get our separate kayaks next time. <laughs> I heard that. Yeah. So far, we've just done canoes because we do pretty well if we're in the same sure. the same structure. You know what we did last weekend, though? We went snowshoeing here in Des Moines Waterworks Ooh. Park. And right along the Raccoon River. And um, I'm not the most skilled snowshoer, but I sure give it a really good try. But um, it was so beautiful and so quiet. And there were deer down on the ice on the river. And it's just, there's no sound except the wind. It was absolutely beautiful. It was great. Oh, that would be wonderful. But, you know, snow melted pretty quickly, but that was fun. Um, so anyway, it's a wonderful job. And yes, I so, um, we, I work with a consultant, a public relations consultant, who's helping us put together our communication strategy for the year around water quality and um, all those sorts of, of water quality issues and, and regulations and things. Um, I um, work closely with our government relations team, uh, an organization called Advocacy Strategies, and they're our voice at the Capitol every day and, and into the night. And so we were up there yesterday. We met with one of our state representatives from Western Iowa to talk about some of our legislative priorities. And he listened carefully and, and you know, kind of pointed us into to the direction of a couple of other legislators. I'm hoping that maybe we can make some inroads. Um, so anything externally, I belong to, I sit on a couple of different um, committees and boards where we hope to make advances in protecting and restoring our water quality. Um, so everything for us is about protecting the public health of our customers mm -hmm. and, you know, cleaning up our source water. So um, I get to work with all kinds of people. Like you, I, when I was here my first eight weeks, my I have a great boss. His name is Ted Corgan. He's our new CEO and he... Um, has some really great initiatives and he was kind enough to invite me to come back to help work on them and I'm thrilled to be back but in our first eight weeks when I came back in October we met with I'm going to say 38 different groups and organizations wow. just to understand what everyone's doing talking about coalition building and now I think we're up to something like 48 or 49 different groups and organizations and agencies and I love that and I can't wait till we're post pandemic and we can start meeting people in person again mm -hmm. but Wow, I've had, I've learned so much from people in the last 12 weeks since I came back and um, just who's working on what for water quality and who can we partner with at the state and regional and federal level even. So we're excited about uh, a new EPA administration and, and um, we're excited that Secretary Vilsack has Iowa Ruse. So perhaps we can have a synergy between uh, the USDA and the EPA and kind of focus on our water quality issues in the Mississippi River Basin. And yes. That's just a bunch of really fun stuff I get to work on right mm -hmm. now. I remember when Vilsack I, was our governor, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yes. He's a good dude. We like him. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's exciting. Um, I, I get to work on all kinds of which what I think are fun things. Cool. I think they're fun, too. And I love hearing about it. And I love being able to share what you do and what's going on because I feel like unless there's a situation like several years ago with watershed contamination you don't hear about what's going on you hear about all of the negative things and you just think oh this is a serious problem and we need to recognize that it's a serious problem and not always sugarcoat or look on the bright side but we don't hear the bright side a lot of the time either or we don't know what we can do or what other people can do to affect this positively we just hear this is a problem these farmers are dumping these things and they've poisoned our well, they poison the water hole and it, like <laughs> but well they're just trying to do what they have to do to get their output and support the farm bill and you know ha but we don't always know how those coalitions can be formed and and what what, yeah. what can go on either you hear the bad things and fingers are pointed and fingers are pointed in both directions and you this you is don't hear really rely on science yes that's where science comes in handy. i like science yeah. <laughs> so when, when you like science it tends to take some of the emotion out of the yeah. conversation but yeah so like somebody has to have the voice of water mm -hmm. we have lots of voices in the state for growing corn and growing soybeans and and you know what um people who want to drink clean water and recreate in our beaches need to have a voice as well i would like that yeah. <laughs> i think our and listeners so want what, that 
Yeah, that's what everyone can do. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone can do that. If, if that's important to you, all you have to do is pick up the phone or email your elected official and say, this is important to me. And I think people feel like they have to be experts and they don't have to be experts. Sure. So even so, just calling and saying, hey, I would absolutely. really like you to consider this. This is important to me. That's enough. Absolutely. And just say, and it's make it personal. So, um, you know, if you want to, whatever your local lake is that you like, just call up your legislator and say, I wish that the beach was cleaner at my local lake, mm. whatever, or, or Backbone State Park. Sure. I wish that the river was cleaner in Backbone State Park. What could you do to help us mm-hmm. get cleaner water? You know, just say that you don't have to be a scientist or an attorney or any of those things. You have a really powerful voice if you use it. Sure. So that would be your recommendation for what we can do. My next question was going to be, how can we help as consumers and water drinkers from the public sector? How, what can we do? We can call, we can vote, we can support bills being passed by just calling and sharing our voice. And of course we can take, you know, kind of our grassroots approach too of making sure we're doing what we can and trying to not pollute trying to lessen our carbon footprint absolutely and this is a wonderful forum i'm so happy and i was listening to uh i've been listening to different i mean audrey tronlam at the university yes. of Northern iowa everything like up to kelp jerky you, yes. i mean you're shining such a wonderful spotlight on these issues so this is perfect and all of the things that you said plus pay attention to where your food comes from mm-hmm. Um, you know, like where, if you, if you choose to eat meat, where, where did it come from? You should know that. Sure. And so, um, I, for example, I ordered for my son-in-law, uh, cheese, winter cheese boxes mm-hmm. from a thing, from a place called Lost Lake Farms Ooh. here in Iowa. Oh, and they're so cute. And they sent out postcards of their cows and, and then they send a cheese box. So like support people who support your values. Sure. And so you can, anybody can do that. Mm-hmm. But, um, and so all the things that you said of making your voice known and um, and being careful where you source your food and, and, and so on is, is really important. Um, I think those are all great ideas. And, and to have forums like this for you that raise these, these ideas up and give water a voice mm-hmm. and give, um, you know, regenerative agriculture a voice, I think is awesome. Well, thank you. I'm trying. Man, it's been a journey for me, too. I get to learn so much, and I I feel so fortunate that I get to share all of this, too. I truly, guys, like, I forget that I'm on, like, we're actually being recorded right now, and I forget that (laughs) because I'm just having a really cool conversation. (laughs) And I get to share this with with more people, too. So thank you so much. And if we want to learn more about what you're doing i mean des moines waterworks has a wonderful wonderful sustainability portion of their website to show what they're doing as far as water quality goes um the mini sode that released yesterday so when this is coming out i think two weeks ago guys look for that mini sode on how des moines is leading the way for hopefully eventually 24 7 carbon free electricity by 2035 yes. how friggin cool is that first city in the u.s to commit to doing something like that, guys, here in Iowa, like I already saw that you uh, posted that. Yes. That is really uh, <laughs> hey, hey, and one last plug for what you can do. Yeah, because of you brought that up. So, find a charity like a, a small nonprofit here in the state mm. that is doing really important work in this area. And the reason I, I raise that up is because, uh, for example, the energy program at the Iowa Environmental Council they work so hard to get that those policies in place um, for you know clean energy. Um, so. If whatever your passion is, uh, you know, your time and resources to a nonprofit here in the state are really valuable sure. to keep that going. And but the Iowa Envi- Environmental Council is a nonprofit organization. Is that correct? Yep. Yes. And they yep. can the be 501c3. found 501c3. Look at them go. IAenvironment.org. Awesome. And then, uh-huh. and, then, and then Des Moines Water Works is a member of I, Iowa Environmental Council. Hmm. There's maybe 80 member organizations, okay. so it's really cool. cool. And then Des Moines Water Works, DMWW.com. And as I always tell everybody, if you're interested in clean water, we'll meet with anyone. I love so. it. Love <laughs> it. Oh, thank you so much, guys. Again, this has been Jennifer Terry of currently Des Moines Water Works previously the IEC, the Iowa Environmental Council, nailed it, that I've been having issues saying this whole time. (laughs) There's too many vowels. Uh. 
and then the previous episode too, where the water is our accidental spotlight for this last half of winter and spring. And I'm so excited about it because it is, it is in everything we do. Is it, it is in us. It is in what we touch. It is in every single piece of food that we eat. If you are eating animals, those animals had to drink water. If you are plant-based, those plants were grown with this water. If you want to talk about quality of things that we ingest water is the main source of all of these things. That's right. Ugh. It's incredible. <laughs> Mind blown. So many mic drops. I'm loving talking about water. Jennifer, any last words? Any last suggestions? I think we covered a lot. No, we did. I just want to thank you for giving water a voice and making it possible for people to grab a hold of these <sighs> things. Well, thank you. I am honored. Thanks so much for listening, guys. Thanks for watching. If you're watching, check us out on social media, and I'll put some links to these wonderful organizations, their websites. If they're social media handles, I will feature them there. And I'll look into this uh, Livestock on the Land, that documentary that Jennifer mentioned, too, and see if that is, has public access, too, that we may be able to watch. I'll see you guys next time.